Jordan Peterson wrote a book of poetry titled An ABC of Childhood Tragedy, Volume 1, and it was something else. You may not have heard of this book because all mention of it, including the video promoting its release, have been removed from Jordan Peterson's YouTube page and website. The reason why? I'm not entirely sure, but you might have a few guesses by the end of this video why Peterson is not, perhaps, happy to promote the existence of this book. But before we dive into this very strange collection, I must offer a word of warning. These poems are very dark and have multiple depictions of several types of child abuse. If that's an issue for you, consider dropping out now. I can't stress this enough, these poems go to some places. Now with that warning out of the way, let's head straight into the darkness. If you don't know who Jordan Peterson is, I'm not sure why you clicked on this video, but the short version is he's a Canadian psychologist who rose to fame opposing a piece of legislation that amended Canadian hate speech laws to include trans people. His most successful work is the self-help book 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, and he became something of a darling in right-wing media circles and currently works for Ben Shapiro's Daily Wire. His popularity has led him to release a number of projects outside of his typical religiously infused self-help work. For instance, he released a song titled, Wake Up. You could say he fancies himself as a bit of a renaissance man, exploring various parts of high culture, from commenting on the arts to wearing tailored suits made out of mean tweets written about him. Tiny Elon Musk heads, and uh, this is a Twitter suit. In the lining here, there is a bunch of comments from Twitter about another suit this company made for me. The poems in this collection were written by Peterson sometime in the past, though no specific date is given. In a promotional video, he describes them as having been written while he was doing clinical work. This places them, at most recent, in 2017, though it's quite likely they were written well before then. Each poem is accompanied by a piece of art by Juliet Fogra. She's an artist whose work can be seen in previous Peterson endeavors, specifically Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life, a sequel to the 12 Rules for Life book. You may also have noticed her work in the Wake Up song as well. Okay, that's enough of that. The book itself, which I found in my local library, is about the size of a picture book, printed on very nice, glossy paper, and has the feel of a high-quality children's book. But make no mistake, this is certainly not for children. Rather, what this book details is a series of short poems about children who have suffered horrible tragedies, wounds both psychological and physical, and diving into the substance of these poems reveals a certain perspective on childhood, parenting, and tragedy. Each poem corresponds to a different letter of the alphabet featuring a child named after the respective letter. As an example, here is the poem for D, as read by Peterson himself. Ooh. D. This is a very rough one. Dick was a damaged little boy whose prancing father made him coy when he ended up in jail. All competed for his tail. Obviously, this is a very dark poem, and certainly not the only one of its kind, so I hope you took that warning seriously if this really upsets you. The story of this poem is a bit unclear. Dick has been damaged by his prancing father, which seems to be a reference to his father being gay, though there is some ambiguity in the final two lines, as I'm not entirely sure if it's Dick who ends up being sexually assaulted in jail, or his father. I'm more inclined to assume Dick, as the children are typically the focus of these poems, but this isn't exclusively the case, and like all art, it's open to interpretation. As poetry analysis and Jordan Peterson aren't my areas of expertise, I spoke to a few people about these poems and their context. I spoke to Zoe B. I have a comment on the tone of this collection. It's bad and inconsistent. Uh, is That's my comment. And Lola Sebastian. He reminds me of every professor that I loved so dearly if they were stupid and evil. Because of their poetry expertise. And I spoke with Cass Harris. The entire thing feels very try-hard. Like, oh, we're talking about all this stuff just to be edgy and to trigger the libs because they're going to hate that we're talking about this in such a flippant manner. For her experience reading the works of Peterson. You'll be hearing their comments about various poems as we go along. And if you pay attention to the corner of the screen, you'll see a little graphic to indicate who's talking. For now, let's go back to the D poem. Jordan Peterson's like, yeah, so this is the story of how this kid had a dad who was a criminal. And when the kid ended up in jail, they all f***ed him. I think that it's about the dad. It's absolutely just disgusting. 
But I think that that might be the sort of dark irony that he's going for here is, oh, you abused your son. Now you're going to get abused. I love when people imply that gay people are all pedophiles. It's also impossible not to note the interpretation between the images in the text as Peterson's words are given shape by Fogra. For Dee, we can see the image of two men with a child in the foreground. To me, I see Dick's father on the left, a young Dick in the middle, and an older Dick on the right. Although perhaps it's Dick's father that's in jail. But to me, these seem like two different men, albeit related. And of course, a small teddy bear on the ground representing Dick's lost youth and innocence. Much like how Mr. Burns' teddy bear Bobo symbolized that on The Simpsons. While not every poem is about a child being sexually abused, this certainly isn't the only one. And of the three sample poems Peterson read in the promo video, for some reason he chose two that covered that particular subject. F. Frederick was sadly flawed after he was madly pawed by his neighbor, deeply awed. Where the hell was Christian God? Well, so these are a bit Brothers Grimm-like, I suppose. You know what I think would have been a stronger final line is where the hell was freddy's god whatever it is that he believed in has abandoned him the art in f is a bit more interesting than it was for d though instead of the obvious teddy bear imagery we get a man holding a rabbit perhaps revealing a reference to alice in wonderland that he's like using this rabbit to appeal to this child to lure him down the rabbit hole of homosexuality Mm. Which is such a f***ed up thing <laughs> to imply about a literal child who's being abused. Also, it should be noted that Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland, had a fixation on young girls. And while we're on this grisly subject, let's move on to I. And this one I'll have to narrate myself. Isaiah embodied idiocy, but he hoped that he'd get free from the priest's kind buggery, though his corpse could hardly flee. I think Zoe's reaction to seeing this one for the first time says it all. Oh my jeez, what the fuck? <laughs> We're not even halfway through the alphabet, and we've already had three incredibly dark poems about children being sexually abused. While there are several poems in the book that aren't quite so dark, these ones are the most striking because of how disturbing they are. The harsh scolding of Granville's grasping grandmother isn't nearly as memorable. The I poem is another confusingly written piece. It seems to be both about necrophilia and pedophilia. But through reading it, you can't quite tell if one followed the other, or perhaps it's just the necro part. The image of a lamb is in no way subtle, though the art clearly didn't come together as the child is drinking some kind of sacramental wine. It's an edited image that was originally a balloon, maybe? These images were put together in Photoshop, sort of like a collage, taking photographs and editing them together. Sometimes it works out, and sometimes we get images like this one. The imprecision here in both text and imagery reveal a constant problem with this collection. It introduces ideas, but never goes far enough to finish the thought. The poems about sexual abuse in particular don't amount to much more than presenting the horrific. There is a sort of subtext about the inadequacy of religion, unable to offer real protection to the people, perhaps reflecting that childhood tragedy occurs through indifferent or malicious authority figures. Is this really meant to be insightful, though? It's stating something incredibly obvious. Children are often hurt because of a lack of care from those expected to protect them. There might be more to say if it focused on the theme of religion, but that never gets explored much deeper than this. And if anything, the story of a gay father traumatizing his son, and indeed all gay characters in these poems being depicted as predators, reinforces the sort of religious intolerance that has victimized children for centuries. The poetry reveals contradictions that go unexamined by the speaker of these poems, dressed in the illusion of compassion for children, rather using that tragedy to let the speaker express a directionless frustration or channeling it into a meaningless, cruel laughter. Usually, poetry collections are divided into sections. Each section is its own sort of self-contained thing. But when you're doing something like this, where like the whole collection of poems is just one thing, then like, yeah, you, you have to make sure that they are consistent with each other or else it just, it sucks. There was some interesting discussion around P, which had a few interpretations aside from the obvious abuse angle. Polly had a pretty dolly that she pushed inside a trolley. A strange intruder pinched her doll and used it to ensure her fall. 
pinched might mean the doll was stolen, but Cass saw another interpretation. It's not explicit in the text, but I feel like that's sort of anti-vax. I could read this without the image there. A stranger grabbing her doll and then using that as a come into my van, girly. But with the nurse there, the only way I can read it is vaccines are okay and safe. See, so your doll can do it. If we take Peterson at his word, these poems were written before COVID-19, as Peterson left clinical practice in 2017. But the images were likely done in either 2021 or 2022, since Voger began working as an artist for Peterson with Beyond Order, which was published in 2021. One can only guess how much direction Peterson gave his artists for these images, but at the very least, he had to approve them. I would get that this poem was originally written with the idea of it all being stolen, but was then modified to have a second anti-vax meaning when the image was later created, which might also explain why the doll's arm is lit so brightly, and why a nurse would ever be called a strange intruder. It also reclassifies this poem from being yet another story of a child being unspeakably harmed by a stranger to a child being victimized by an agent of government policy, something more interesting and an authority angle not really covered in any of the other poetry. And considering this never comes up again, it's why I'm more inclined to think this is just the artist interpreting it her own way. Although I would also suggest the artist remember where her subject's arms are when creating the collage, because I have no idea what's going on with this nurse's arm. Where is her elbow, and why is it bending like that? Not every tragedy in this book is a tale of violation, though. For example, the poem for Kay. Katie's hair was kind of curly, and her teeth were kind of pearly, but her skin was kind of gnarly, and she remained an ugly girly. This is just a mean poem calling a little girl ugly. This makes me want to fight him? Jordan, look a child in the eyes and tell them that they're ugly. She's the butt of the joke because she's kind of an ugly girly? And there are several poems that are somewhat in this vein where the child is not the victim of being mistreated by an adult, but rather are little terrors themselves, frequently meeting a horrible end. Here's one example. Theo detested by all those who knew her, a terrible treacherous troll. Her classmates forced her into a box and did not leave an air hole. Theo died because she was horrible. That's a tragedy, yes, but one the poem tells us is of her own making. There are other poems like this, some really disturbing ones where children are brutally punished, but are presented as being in some way deserving of it. The judgmental tone of these tragedies reveal the speaker of these poems as having an almost cruel indifference to these children. This might be interesting if the poems were constructed in a more thoughtful way. Here's N. Nellie's noisome nanny. Spanked her nerveless on the fanny. Never ever let her be. Nagged her almost constantly. This is a poem about a child being abused, and that's it. Many of the poems are just that. It's another example of how these poems just don't finish their thoughts. They're just vague gestures to something horrific, not really considering them in any way that will give you more insight into the situation, and certainly not providing any sort of entertainment value. To what slight credit I can give it, a poem like the one for the letter N is something of a relief to read in comparison to the darker ones, but there's still sad and cruel stories of children being victimized, often with writing that is flat, sloppy, and forced. And in the case of O, the writing is just confusing. Oscar's oafish father's views and his onslaughts of harsh abuse, his words that couldn't but confuse, left poor Oscar quite obtuse. Zoe was kind enough to give this one a close reading. Oscar's father is oafish, okay? And he has some views that, you know, we, we can infer that these views are bad. He has onslaughts of harsh abuse, so he is very mean to his child. You know, maybe these views that he has make him very mean and, like, very vocal about these negative things. But then we get to the turn here in the third line. His words couldn't but confuse. So he has these really mean things that he's saying. He is very oafish. But it's confusing? Like, it is both abusive and confusing? Pick one. And because of that, Oscar became obtuse. Yeah, I feel like the point of the poem is like, Oscar's dad was a leftist. And it left him confused and dumb but then they add this whole abuse narrative in so it's like uh, uh 
yeah, like, is it that his views were confusing and didn't make sense and therefore he raised, you know, an unintelligent child or whatever? Or is it that he was abusive? In which, like, where, how, I don't understand how abusive and confusing work together to create an obtuse child. I'm not sure what to do with this. While it's tempting to read something into a poem about confusion, also being confusing itself, I'm very reluctant to give this poem the benefit of the doubt when so many other poems are similarly written so clumsily. They aren't even making the same mistakes repeatedly, which would hint to the reader that it's being done on purpose. Rather, the mistakes seem to be done at random. Again, another example of an amateur at work here. As an example of a technique that's inconsistently deployed, you might have noticed that these poems have a very loose relationship with alliteration, often front-loading them with some alliteration in the first line or two, and then dropping them completely, although some poems will then pick it up towards the end, all being done randomly. Here's an example for the letter X. Zandra existed on a shoestring and excelled at blithering. Her old father had enough, and what he did was rather rough. There's no real reason to drop the E in front of these, aside from holding on to the very basic understanding of alliteration most amateur poets have. Poetry pro tip. If you have too much alliteration where the first letter of the words is the same, if you have too much of that, it makes your poetry look amateurish. Something else that makes your poetry look amateurish is uh, center aligning. Pro tip for all the viewers, left align your poems please, unless you were doing something interesting with the structure of it. This book is very clearly the work of an amateur, and while amateur poetry can be a lovely and beautiful thing, it's also not typically sold in stores for 30 American dollars. Perhaps the most disturbing part about all these poems of children being sexually abused, among other horrors, is that this book was intended to be darkly humorous. It struck me how many of the poems were basically, like, the punchline? felt like it was child sexual abuse lol and yes that was definitely the author's intent pretty brutal terribly comical perhaps if you have that sense of humor it also reveals how narrow this book's idea of tragedy is you want to do an abc's of fruit and say c is for citrus and then do like l is for lemons g is for grapefruit m is for mandarins it just feels extremely repetitive if it's a whole book, why is it a whole book of citrus if it's the ABCs of fruit? You get to like S and it's like S is for star fruit. And you're like, finally. And then it's like, but also limes. We forgot to mention limes because L is taken up by lemons. And it's like Jordan. Childhood tragedies aren't just stories of abuse. Losing a beloved family member or pet can be a tragedy. Having your heart broken for the first time can be a tragedy. Even not making a sports team can be tragic for a child. But in this book, the majority of tragedies we get are stories of abuse. And the ones that aren't are just cruelly mocking a child for being ugly. In this case, the abuse seems to be coming from the poet himself. A more honest title for this collection would have been An ABC of Childhood Abuse, though that wouldn't carry with it quite the same promise of dark humor. The inspiration for this collection is Edward Gorey's The Gashly Crumb Tinies. Gorey's quirky illustrations were paired with alphabetically named children, all coming to bizarre ends. Here's a quick sample. M is for Maud, who was swept out to sea. N is for Nebel, who died of ennui. The pairing of the gruesome and the comical, along with the clear fact that these lines are meant to be read together, reveals a darkly humorous touch, punctuated by the comical drawings, with my favorite being little Neville barely staring out the window. This is a fun little book that, unlike the Peterson one, is genuinely humorous. It's simple, quirky, and surprising, all very helpful to actually get a laugh out of people. In comparison, Peterson's book is so much darker and disturbingly real. Its only surprises come from the shock of its brutality. It's as though he read the gory book and the lesson he took away is that what made it funny was not the absurdity and quirkiness, but the pain and misery of children. Some of the images in the gory book are quite graphic, but in the context of a cartoon, it's not quite as upsetting as seeing a real child's face along a story of that child being abused. Peterson's poetry is never as clever or witty, and when it tries to be, it often falls on its face. There was also a pattern to these poems and a strange justification for physical violence. Children are often presented as deserving physical punishment, brought onto themselves by their behavior. This is consistent with what Peterson has written in his books. He was all for corporal punishment, 
with the line being that like as long as it didn't go too far it was appropriate to the action or the behavior that you were trying to stop but then never clearly saying where that line is you know completely ignoring that like the like the american association of pediatrics or um you know children doctors say don't hit your kids period full stop there's also a gender quality to how women who abuse their children are often punished in ways that men aren't. It creates the impression that using violence to punish children, when done in moderation by a man, is somehow justified, something completely at odds with any expert on raising children. I can't stress this enough. There's no reason to discipline a child with physical violence, and doing that will only do harm. These poems might make more sense if we consider that the speaker is some kind of villain. If there was more of an interplay between the pictures and the text, where the text was saying these horribly cruel things, and it was obvious that almost the narrator is the villain here? The problem with this interpretation is that often there's no real sense of irony towards the narrator through most of the poems. The laughter is directed less at the narrator's mistaken appraisals and more at the children and their horrid circumstances. This whole collection is a misunderstanding of how gallows humor works. It's only funny when it's the person in the gallows making the joke. Someone mocking a person about to die is just an asshole. Another thing that makes this collection disturbing is how many of these poems were written while Peterson was in clinical practice and as a response to what he saw in those situations. It makes one wonder how closely some of these stories correspond to those of his patients. In both 12 Rules for Life and Beyond Order, Peterson was quite comfortable using stories of his clients to illustrate his points. Using them in his poetry hardly seems like a stretch, and if this is him blowing off steam, like he said, I suppose in some sense it was an attempt to blow off some steam. It seems extremely counterproductive to share these feelings in public. I don't begrudge someone expressing themselves in their art, and I can imagine any therapist may have less than flattering thoughts towards some of their patients at times. But to then so publicly express the most negative of those thoughts? I'm not sure how anyone would trust a guy like this with any of their most personal stories. And I wonder what his previous patients must think, knowing that their trauma was used to sell a pricey book of amateur poetry. It also speaks to a kind of elitism that seems to run through Peterson's work, including these poems, that these poor people need someone like Jordan Peterson to help them. That came up while reading said, or Z for Americans, but since Jordan Peterson is Canadian, I'm pretty sure it's said. Zachariah's vacuity, felt with acuity, came as a jolt to his father, the dolt. The picture especially, like, ties this all together, this kid in this family, like, they're just a bunch of dumb hicks, worthy of our derision simply by virtue of being dumb hicks. In The Rise of Peterson, a documentary that chronicled his rise to prominence, we can see some of this manifest itself not only in how he's treated by his fans, with the highly deferential artwork they make of him, but also his own aspirations for the type of funeral he would like. The earliest political memory I have, it was when Robert Kennedy was shot. I don't know how old I was, probably four or five, and I watched his funeral and I thought, I'm going to have a funeral like that. There was also that weird dream that his wife had. And then he says, and Bernie, Tammy, that's his wife, had a dream. He said, okay, what was the dream? And sometimes your dreams are prophetic. What was the dream? She dreamed it was five minutes to midnight. The end of the world. And Jordan is there to save us from that. This is important to consider when discussing this book of poetry because the artist who created the images for it is a huge Peterson fan. Juliette Foger was selected to work on Beyond Order by winning a contest. And by the way, art contests are exploitative and predatory as many artists create original works that they are then not compensated for. Ahead of the release of Beyond Order, Foger sat down with Peterson to discuss what her motivations were for creating her artwork. I wanted to make you smile. <laughs> Well, that might seem kind of nice, things got a little weird when she mentioned something she placed in one of the Beyond Order images. This is regarding an image of Saint Anthony being tormented by a demon, and Fogra is talking about her inspiration for her depiction of Saint Anthony. Jordan, look at the eyes. Doesn't it remind you of anybody? <clears throat> Who is it? That's you. <clears throat> Even Peterson looks a little uncomfortable hearing that, and it seems strange to be partnering with an artist who is so utterly devoted to a writer. 
Also, I need to show you all a deeply cursed image that she sells as an art print on her website. The price speaks for itself, as does depicting Jordan Peterson as Jesus Christ. It's a bit sad that even as the Messiah, Peterson couldn't wrangle up enough friends to do a proper recreation of The Last Supper. This is less a partnership of equals, but rather an artist who is completely subordinate to a writer. Within that context, it becomes easier to understand the flippant tone in these poems towards these suffering children. To mock a suffering child, or the memory of a traumatic childhood, one would need to hold themselves as superior in some way, as either one who has not suffered, or one who has overcome it. This is a huge part of Peterson's persona. He presents himself as the public intellectual, the renaissance man who appreciates the finer things in life. He regularly speaks about things like climate change, of which he has no understanding whatsoever, as if he should be considered in the conversation. This poetry collection is very much the work of someone who has a higher opinion of their poetic writing ability than the work itself reflects. And the reason he's been able to do this is because he's surrounded by people who hold him in a level of regard that is a bit overstated. And I think it's fair to say that when he's literally being depicted by one of them as Jesus Christ. I need to talk about one response I got to the poem V, though. When Vertiline was just a child, her mother, vulgar, vain, and vile, left her for someone worthwhile, let her grow up void and wild. Honestly, I like this. Okay, so void is probably bad. Like, I think that children do need parents or parental figures. They need people in their lives who care for them. But this child now has the freedom and agency to take her own life into her own hands and do what she wants to do instead of having to be abused by this awful lady. Zoe's reading of this poem was able to divorce it not only from her knowledge of Peterson's less-than-kind attitudes towards women, but also the rest of the poems we read that reveled in the misery of children. By ignoring that knowledge, she read something more uplifting and interesting than what, to me, read like yet another poem about a child's life being ruined by a bad parent. It's difficult to discuss this collection of poetry without considering the very public persona of Jordan Peterson. What we know or believe of him will undoubtedly color our experiences of the work. Poetry exists in a context, and as much as I would like to think we can separate art from the artist, and I often try to do that myself, this video, I think, serves as a testament to the difficulty of doing that. My guests all had opinions on Peterson before reading his poetry, and while I would describe them as informed opinions, they're also opinions that would undoubtedly color their interpretation of his work. The same would be true of people who are keen on Peterson, though. They would likely be far more willing to excuse or ignore the flaws to reaffirm their appreciation of him. Looking at the reviews of this book online, you can see evidence of that. Even the reviews from his fans who acknowledge the less-than-stellar quality of the poetry still rate it highly, sometimes going to extremes to praise it. Here's one example. The book itself, presented as an oversized hardcover, is a work of art not only as a specimen of the written word, but also as an example of the visual arts and even as a physical item. Peterson's profile has similarly impacted readings less concerned about the quality of the work itself. Here's an example of someone who is fond of Peterson. These are funny because in good humor, there's always a significant truth. Beneath the surface of these poems, Peterson demonstrates his profound understanding of human nature and human psychology, illustrated in style that matches the tone of the poems, not for the easily or frequently offended or the usual woke idiots who have nothing better to do than actively seeking subjects about which to complain. On the other hand, we can see where if you take a tone like this. Sounds more like an ABC of irony and hypocrisy now when Peterson has a contract with the Daily Wire and shake hands over the dinner table with Shapiro and Netanyahu who organize and or sponsor the shelling of Palestinian children every other day. Did this serve as a source of inspiration for Peterson's book? Did he see this before inviting Ron Dermer to spread pro-Israel propaganda? Neither of these reviews go into much detail about the poems themselves, but rather use their existence to further their narratives about Peterson within the culture war. It divorces this collection from any serious analysis, not even trying to engage with it directly. Although I feel slightly bad for a book of poetry that will never escape the shadow of its author's profile, this is also a book I would never have read if not for that profile, and I doubt it would have even been published had it not had Peterson's name on it. This is a classic double-edged sword where a book of poetry isn't allowed to exist on its own merits because of the person who wrote it, but it also wouldn't exist as an item you could buy in a store if not for Peterson's profile. 
So when you consider that, none of these reviews or this video are bad or useless because it doesn't completely divorce the artist from the art. But I mention all of this because I think it's important to acknowledge how we understand art in a context, and that our subjective opinions are shaped by that context in a way that exists outside of the art itself. Anyone who thinks of themselves as some sort of objective critic of art is hopelessly trapped in that context. Perhaps a better way to consider this poem without the facade of objectivity is through using art itself, like with this review. I'm a huge Peterson fan, but the poetry was mid. Maybe I don't comprehend. So should I read again? Aesthetically, this book is pleasing. The art, the darkness, was appeasing. I wouldn't say this work's exceeding. I'd say this one's not worth reading. I appreciate that this person turned the review into a poem. And while it's a bit rough around the edges, I like it. It told a nice little story, and it's more fun than any of Peterson's poems, probably because there are no children being sexually abused in it. It's the sort of thing I imagine the author jotted down quickly to express themselves, and it's more engaging than any of the other reviews I read. This book has largely flown under the radar. Peterson hasn't really promoted it much on his channel, and based on the number of reviews it's gotten, very few people have bought it since it was released back in October of 2022. It seems as though, even with his massive diehard fans, there isn't much of a market for a collection of Jordan Peterson poetry. It raises a very important question I had while working on this project. Who is this book of poems for? Only the most devoted of Peterson fans show any appreciation of this, and based on the reviews, a significant portion of them walked away unimpressed. Most poetry enthusiasts wouldn't be impressed with this collection as it's clearly the work of an amateur who needs to spend more time figuring out how to express himself, and anyone in search of a good laugh or any kind of entertainment is better off rereading Edward Gorey. The only person I can imagine this poetry having any use is Jordan Peterson himself. This work would have been better suited to a handful of papers stuffed in a desk drawer rather than a hardcover sitting on bookstore shelves. I want to give a big thanks to the voices you heard on this video, Zoe B, Lola Sebastian, and Cass Eris. You can check out their channels linked below. All their videos are great, go watch all of them. I was debating how much of Peterson's poetry I could show here without it feeling like I was giving away too much of the book, but it turns out you can actually read the whole thing online for free if you go to the artist's website. For some reason, every single poem with all the corresponding images are up on there. So if you'd like to read more of the poetry, you can do so, although I highly recommend you not waste the 15 minutes or so that would take. It's been a while since I did a book review, and I'd like to do a few more this year, so hopefully I will get around to reading some more terrible books written by conservatives. If you are someone who appreciated this video and would like to see more of them in the future, you can be like the fine names you see scrolling up the screen and become a patron or a member. They get early access to each of my videos. They also get fun little extras I throw in now and again, like the occasional deleted scene and insights onto what videos are coming up next. They also get their names in the credits. If you would like to support the channel in a non-monetary fashion though, you can like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. If you don't know what to comment, I will be awarding exactly zero bonus points to anyone who responds with a comment that is also a poem. Thank you all so much for watching.